coming on the air tonight as it is about to go down here in Washington with the House set to vote really in an hour, two hours, three hours on a plan that could avoid a potential disaster of a default if the government can't pay its bills on time. So will this be one step closer to the end of a major financial drama or not? And where does it go next? We'll take you live to the Hill. Then two more names you probably know set to make the case that they should be the ones in the White House come 2025. We're live in Iowa with the breakdown on these two and the reality check. Plus, Alec Murdoch back in court for the first time since being sentenced for murdering his wife and son, now facing new charges. How he's pleading today and whether it'll be enough to avoid a trial. And an NBC News exclusive. The doctors calling for changes to laws that make it illegal to use drugs while pregnant. And the new moms afraid to get help for their addictions. Then Adidas putting millions of dollars worth of Yeezy sneakers back on sale, trying to get past their Kanye controversy after Ye's racist and anti-Semitic rants. We're getting into how customers are responding to all of it. Coming up. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight we are getting ready for a super important vote on the House floor that we think is going to come in the next couple of hours that could make sure that the U.S. is able to pay its bills on time and avoid a global financial catastrophe. But that is only if the House of Representatives greenlights this deal. A lot of members are a yes, some of them are a no, the devil, as always, in those details. Speaker McCarthy won't say exactly where the numbers stand tonight, although we're keeping our own count. We'll get to that in a second. And the speaker who negotiated this agreement with President Biden to make sure the country makes good on what it owes seems confident. Today, the American people are going to win. We're going to pass the largest cut in American history. It's just a small step putting us on the right track. Okay, so here's where we are now tonight. After tonight, the spotlight will shift over here to the Senate, assuming this vote passes. In the Senate, senators have only four days to get their side of things taken care of before that so-called X date, June 5th, when the Treasury says we will basically crash into a brick wall and default on the debt we owe, which would throw the entire world into a huge economic meltdown. That's not me speculating. That is the actual risk here. And it's those stakes bringing together two people who we almost never see brought together in the Senate, the top Democrat and the top Republican. Watch. I cannot stress enough that we have no margin, no margin for error. When this agreement reaches the Senate, I'll be proud to support it without delay. I want to bring in Ryan Nobles, who is live for us, watching all of it, talking to everybody on Capitol Hill. So what's up, Ryan? Where are the numbers? Are we going to get one step closer to avoiding this default or not? I think we're at the point now, Hallie, where it would be a real big surprise if this vote uh, doesn't pass through the House and pass through with relative ease. We were just able to get a sense of where the lawmakers stand. Uh, they just voted on what's called the rule, which is a procedural step before the final vote today. Uh, that did require some Democrats to come over and help Republicans get it over the finish line, but they were able to do that. It did pass with ease. And so that does give us a pretty good indication that Kevin McCarthy has the votes uh, to uh, get Get this debt ceiling bill passed in the House, and then it'll go over to the Senate, which we can talk about in a second. But there is, of course, a question about how this impacts McCarthy going forward. There are many conservative Republicans that are very upset about the way this deal was negotiated and what the final product looked like. And there's always this, this kind of uh, you know cloud that's hanging over Kevin McCarthy called a motion to vacate, where just one member can at any time call into question his speakership and force a vote. McCarthy told us today, though, he's not worried about it. Take a listen. Worried about a challenge to your speakership? Not at all. Why should I? They have the ability to do that. They're not worried they about have the ability every day to do that. They have the ability every day, and they haven't used it since that first week of his speakership. And, you know, there were a couple of conservative Democrats, or Republicans, I should say, that floated this idea. They quickly seemed to back away. Hallie, it does seem as though Kevin McCarthy's going to be able to pull off his part of this bargain. And we'll have to see what happens on the Senate side later this week. Okay, well, let's talk about what could happen on the Senate side. Assuming and stipulating that this thing gets through the House, as you say, the question being how many Republicans support it, right? Over in the Senate... As we joyously lift ourselves out of the weeds, there's drama over some of these amendments that some of these senators want to see, right? Like the word slimy has been thrown around here. Like there is some snipety snipe snipe happening over on the Senate side, even though like it looks as though potentially as of the moment likely to get through. Fair? 
That is fair, and it's important to keep in mind, Hallie, that the bar is a little bit higher to cross in the Senate, right? They need That's 60 true. votes, not just a simple majority. So uh, that does mean that it's a little bit more complicated, and there's also a time factor involved here. Uh, you know, any senator can slow down this process, and if that process is slowed down, there is a scenario by which they wouldn't be able to vote on this until uh, June 7th, which is, of course, two days past the X date. But it looks as though they're going to work out an, an, an agreement that will allow amendment votes to take place, because you're right, there are members that have serious concerns about this legislation, including Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia. Listen to what he had to say. There is appetite for permanent reform here. There's a Republican House that likes this thing. They could get it done in the, according to Hoyle. It might take them a little bit longer, but they can get it done. But the notion of doing it this way, it's slimy. So what he's talking about here is a pipeline that's been greenlit that will run through West Virginia and comes close to Virginia. It's something that both he and Mark Warner oppose, but Joe Manchin of West Virginia, Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia are very much in favor of. What's going to happen here, Hallie, is they're going to put these amendments uh, up to a vote. They're going to need a 60-vote threshold. None of them will likely pass right. because if even one of them passes, we've got to put this go back, back to, in right. the House and a right. whole other process takes place. And no one wants to see that happen because that pushes us way past the X date and the potential of economic default. Point being, it's like messaging amendments over in the Senate. Likely that things will go sort of knock on wood if you care about a global economic meltdown somewhat smoothly <laughs> over there, and then the president will sign it into law. Ryan Nobles, it's going to be a long night for you. I'm sure we'll be seeing more of you tonight on our special coverage right here on NBC News Now. Appreciate it. So listen, if two is company and three is a crowd, then what is nine? Well, it's how many official candidates there are about to be in the Republican primary. With NBC News learning tonight that former Vice President Mike Pence and former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie are about to get into the 2024 race. Pence making the announcement set to, according to our sources in Iowa. Christie, sources say, in New Hampshire. We'll come back to those locations in a second. And these are both men with very real links to the current frontrunner in the Republican race, Donald Trump. Pence obviously was the VP before that split. I mean, he still was the VP then, close with Donald Trump, less close when they split over Mr. Trump's push to overturn the legitimate 2020 election results. Then you had Chris Christie backing Mr. Trump in 2016 after his own failed bid, running Mr. Trump's White House transition before getting cut out of the inner circle and eventually becoming a voice against the former president. Mr. Trump himself, he is already on the campaign trail in Iowa, so is the person considered his most serious competitor at this point, Florida Republican Governor Ron DeSantis. Our Dasha Burns is joining us now from Council Bluffs, Iowa. Okay, Dasha, talk about the Pence of it all, if you will, because he's putting a lot of his political eggs into the sort of state basket behind you there. Iowa, a big focus for him. Talk us through strategy and thinking here. Yeah, the Hawkeye State is probably where Pence has his best shot, Hallie. Look, this is a state with a huge population of religious evangelical voters. That is uh, a huge part of the Republican Party where Pence thinks he has a shot at chipping away at Trump's base. That's where he's going to make his play here. And his campaign plans to visit all 99 counties in Iowa. This will be sort of a Midwest brand of politics, town hall style meetings, uh, drop by sessions at restaurants of, of, of very sort of intimate retail style campaign, which is very much what Iowa voters are looking for. But of course, we've seen the polls. He's not doing so hot right now. So there is a, a long road ahead for uh, the former vice president here in Iowa and beyond, actually, Hallie. Well, for sure. Um, you know, it's interesting here, too. So we talk about sort of the Pence of it all. There's also the Christie of it all as well, because yeah. the state of New Hampshire, which is another important state that I know you'll be spending a lot of time in, kind of crushed his campaign dreams back in 2016. When I was covering yeah. him, he finished sixth there. Obviously, New Hampshire is going to be central to his campaign coming up. We expect him to be holding this town hall there to kick off his campaign. What is the Christie path to victory here, Dasha? And what are the broader concerns among some in the party about having such a big field, a la 2016 to a degree, when Donald Trump is again the frontrunner here? Yeah, 
It's a really great question. What is the path? I'm not sure what it is for Christie right now. I mean, he also witnessed 2016. He was one of the few folks that are joining in now uh, who were there in 2016. And he actually said in a town hall a couple of months ago that he thinks that the strategy was wrong from the candidates in 2016, holding the fire on Trump early on, thinking, oh, we'll just get past uh, these next few rounds and we'll hold the fire until there's a smaller field. He is going to be the guy that jumps in and takes Trump head on. I think he's been watching the growing field of candidates and seeing folks sort of pulling their punches. Tim Scott, Nikki Haley and others not really going after the former president. And he thinks that's a mistake. So he, he's going to jump into the race. It's a long shot. I think he knows that. But he will likely change the dynamics just by that fact alone that it's going to be disruptive in that he's going to do what the other candidates are aren't doing and really uh, take a much harsher, much more direct approach when it comes to the former president. Will that work in terms of getting his poll numbers or uh, any higher, his unfavorables any lower? Maybe, maybe not. Will that change his brand? Maybe. And will that change the dynamic and, you know, perhaps arm Trump a little bit? I think maybe that in and of itself is the goal there, Hallie. Dasha Burns live for us there in Iowa. Dasha, thank you. Convicted double murderer Alec Murdoch back in court today for the first time since being sentenced for killing his wife and son. This time, he's showing up to plead not guilty to new federal charges he's facing connected to alleged financial crimes. We're going to show you here his attorneys arriving at the courthouse earlier as Murdoch faces 22 federal charges, including bank fraud, money laundering and more. According to the 28 page indictment, he was part of an alleged plan to swindle his clients out of money from 2005 till 2021 when Murdoch was arrested on state charges. He's already serving a life sentence for killing his wife, Maggie, and son, Paul, back in 2021. The result of a six week trial that was being called the South's trial of the century. Laura Jarrett, our NBC News legal correspondent, is joining us now. So, Laura, Murdoch's attorney says in a statement his client is cooperating and that they're confident these charges can be resolved quickly without a trial. What's the likelihood of that? Yeah, I think, Hallie, that appears to be where this is going, uh, mm. at least according to Murdoch's attorneys. They told our NBC affiliate there in court today, a bunch of reporters told them they expect a change of plea hearing to happen, Sue. I think, so I think the writing is on the wall, but his legal troubles, as you laid out, are far from over. And we haven't heard from the Justice Department about what they intend to do here and whether they would actually agree to such a plea and what the terms of it might look like. Uh, as you mentioned, he's uh, facing a slew of new charges charges here, everything from money laundering, wire fraud. It all boils down to this idea of accusations that he stole from his clients and that he also took the settlement money to the tune of almost $4 million from the estate of a, a housekeeper that worked in his home for years. Her death was somewhat mysterious at his home. And so the idea there was that, um, obviously, he had swindled them, them out of this money, something he has denied. But we'll see where this change of plea goes if, in fact, it happens. This indictment says that Murdoch got help from another former attorney and, and friend of his who pleaded guilty to similar charges last week. So take that. Take the fact that Murdoch is already sentenced yeah. for murder. Like, does that complicate things for him here? Well, I think certainly the plea from his associate makes it harder um, for him to fight these charges. And, uh, you know, again, he's already behind bars. And so there's been a little bit of a question about why would the feds do this? What's in their interest? Why spend the time and resources on it? Uh, perhaps they were looking for more information and needed this as leverage to get something out of him. He's also facing almost 100 state charges on these very same financial crimes. Again, something that he has denied, although he did admit to a fair amount of it on the stand in that double murder trial. Uh, mm. So we'll see where all of this goes. But the, at the end of the day, he's going to be behind bars for a very long time. Laura Jarrett, thank you very much. Sure. Elsewhere in South Carolina, anger building tonight in one town after a 14-year-old was shot and killed by a convenience store owner who wrongly accused him of stealing. Cyrus Carmack Belton had just graduated from the eighth grade. The eighth grade with Richland County Sheriff today calling his death, and I'm quoting here, senseless not something that should have happened it wasn't necessary uh, should have never been shot in the back he didn't shot and lift uh, so there's no reason for him to be shot like that south carolina congressman james clyburn saying the criminalization of black men and boys has once again led to deadly and heartbreaking circumstances 
Here's what happened, so far as we know. The Carmack Belton went into the store that you see here. It's in Columbia in South Carolina, right around 8 p.m. Sunday night. Police say the store's owner, Rick Chow, thought that the teenager had stolen some bottles of water. At some point, you've got the teenager, you've got Chow, you've got Chow's son getting into an, ar an argument. Carmack Belton took off running. They chased him. Eventually, Chow shot him in the back. You see Chow in court here, who is now being charged with murder. Sam Brock is covering this story and is joining us now. This has really lit a fire under people in some of these communities in South Carolina. There have been protests. We heard from lawmakers. Jim Clyburn is just one of them saying this is another example of what people, of what black Americans have had to deal with now for a very long time. What happened in Colombia ricocheted throughout the entire country, Howie. Yeah. And you have to look at this through the framework of what this community is sort of processing right now and what we just learned this afternoon. They're planning the funeral for a 14-year-old, Cyrus, who, as you said, just finished middle school, was about to matriculate to high school, and now his friends and family are coming together to mourn his death. A couple of elements to this. One, as you said, he was shot in the back. It's not like there was an altercation and perhaps Cyrus was threatening Richard Chow, the owner. At least local authorities say they've reviewed the surveillance here. That does not look like that was the case. He was leaving the store, chased out, and shot in the back. You know, the other part about this is... The example that he pulled out his gun, right? Like, did that necessarily, and I'm talking now about the owner, Richard Chow, there was a history of thefts in his shop. Why is it that the straw that broke the camel's back was this 14-year-old African-American teenager that prompted the store owner to pull out a weapon and ultimately shoot him over, by the way, four bottles of water? That's what authorities say right. he was holding and then put back. That's at the core of this. A couple of statements I want to point out as you ask about community reaction, Hallie. Right. One of them is from Todd Rutherford. He is a state representative in South Carolina. He said, quote, we'll pull this up on your screen. This is an anomaly? No, it is not an anomaly, but I know America can be better. And that is what we're fighting for because no family should have to deal with this in 2023. Let's talk about Rick Chow here, right? Because apparently he's had deputies come to his store before over complaints of shoplifting, arguments, et cetera. It didn't really amount to anything, but like with this question right. of accountability here front and center now, talk through what happens next there. Because as you point out, police, police say this appears to have been an unprovoked shooting. This is where the details matter, right? because potentially you could see one argument being made in defense of Chow that a weapon, a firearm was found near the 14-year-old teenager. So the question becomes, did he point it? Did he wield it? And that's why we heard from the Richland County uh, authorities there, certainly the sheriff and prosecutors, that they reviewed surveillance video and didn't see any signs of that. So it seems to deflate the argument that Richard Chow was acting in self-defense. And it, it just adds to the layers here. You listen to lawmakers. The coroner had this emotional Instagram post where she talked about the fact this could have been my son. There are so many families here mm. who feel the exact same way. The population uh, of Colombia is 41 percent black. And you just get the impression that it's a layered situation. They've seen so many examples like this, that it deeply penetrates once again when there's another tragedy that clearly did not have to happen. Sam Brock, thank you so much for your coverage of this important story. Appreciate it. You got it. We've got some new details late tonight out of Iowa, where we're just learning the owner of that now collapsed apartment building in Davenport is being accused of violating safety rules and could show up in court just over a week from now. It's coming as rescuers are really racing against the clock here to find people who might still be inside what you're looking at now, this partially collapsed apartment. Firefighters have found what they describe as several pets. You see some of them here, but there's still no people that have been found. And this very dangerous search with the building still shifting and crumbling as they look. Remember, just 24 hours ago, we told you right here about the search to find two people believed to possibly still be inside with five people in all unaccounted for right now. Still just questions about where those folks are. People in Davenport right now are angry. Look at this. People protesting outside that building today. They held up signs, put up signs that said, find them first. Because there was a plan that would have torn down the building even before one woman was found alive in it less than 48, 48 hours ago. That's after the city had called off initially the search mission. Our team on the ground talking with the family of that woman who was found after being trapped for 24 hours. She was in a tub with a pillow and blanket the whole time. She said she didn't hear not an ambulance or a fire truck. Ow. And then they did not come and kick in that door to find her. 
I want to bring in Shaq Brewster, who is live for us there in Davenport, Iowa, obviously in front of the building where this has happened. So this new citation against the building owner is interesting here because there have been so many questions about the accountability factor here. Bring us up to speed on that and this race to find anybody inside. Yeah, let's start with the search and that nugget there because we did see throughout the day, especially earlier in the day, there was some activity here at the scene. You see it's fairly quiet now, but this morning we saw the fire chief here. We saw the structural engineer who we heard from in the city's press conference yesterday on the ground. Several men in hard hats going in and out of the grounds behind me. We saw at one point several drones, at least one a pretty big drone up in the air. City officials not confirming if that was their drone, but uh, we do know that drones have been part of this search process. So we have seen a lot of activity, but we have not gotten any updates, Hallie, in nearly 24 hours at this point from the city, even confirming the status of the search and whether or not they are still conducting that search. And then you go to that citation, because that citation was filed by the city even before the press conference that we heard yesterday. Uh, Andrew Wold, the owner of this building, cited for, uh, for cited for, you see the citation there, um, cited and being called the defendant, saying he failed to maintain his building in a safe, sanitary, and structurally sound condition. In that citation, says he will need to appear in court next month, about two weeks uh, into June. And the thing about that citation, Hallie, is the consequence from it, the uh, damages that the city is seeking for that citation is just under $400 in cash. So it's a pretty big difference than what we're hearing in terms of the investigation and possible criminal investigation for the actual collapse of this building. But it is a step forward in the next update that we have here. Again, no official update from the city, but we do have that document that was filed before the city's last update, Alex. Shaq Brewster, live for us there in Davenport. Shaq, thank you very much. So listen, we've learned late tonight that Amazon is paying out something like $30 million in settlements for maybe violating the privacy of you and your kids. First, the Ring doorbell. You know the Ring doorbell. Maybe you have a Ring doorbell. Turns out Amazon has to pay nearly $6 million as part of a settlement with the FTC, which says the company let workers and contractors access people's videos when it wasn't totally necessary for them to do their jobs. Also, Alexa. Amazon now has to fork over something like $25 million to settle allegations that Alexa violated the privacy rights of kids. The FTC says Amazon kept voice and location information of younger users for years. Amazon, in a statement, saying to NBC News, while we disagree with the FTC's claims regarding both Alexa and Ring and deny violating the law, these settlements put these matters behind us. I want to bring in legal analyst Danny Savalos. And Danny, these are things that people all over the country have in their house, right? Like a, a ring doorbell, Alexa, like stuff that is used all the time. Talk to us about these FTC claims about violation of privacy. We'll start first with Alexa. The allegations there were essentially that Alexa and Amazon violated federal law that prohibits the recording of children's voices and keeping those recordings indefinitely. But moving over to the Ring allegations, which are much scarier, uh, the FTC alleged that Ring employees and third-party contractors, including one maybe in Ukraine, had unfettered access to customers' Ring feeds and video and, and images, and they could just view them uh, whenever they wanted. So there's some pretty scary allegations in there about security in the Ring devices, because some people not only use them at their front door, they may use them, use them inside in, right. inside the house as well. So a lot of very serious security concerns here. And even if Amazon may have settled and says in a statement they're putting things behind them, uh, one wonders if the people who may have been captured on those videos and their information is out there somewhere, whether they can truly put it behind them if they don't even know that they've been recorded and maybe viewed by Amazon employees or maybe even third parties. So to this point, like, uh, just to be totally honest, with it, I know somebody here I was talking to has nine ring cameras, like, in their house, inside, outside, whatever. And I was like, wow, did you hear this story? Like, we're going to report on it tonight. It's just, it just happened. And they said, oh, well, at least, the, does, the, at least it means it'll be fixed, right? In other words, they'll, they'll, they'll figure out the security issues and stop it. Is that happening? Is that going to be the case here? In other words, is this um, alleged security issue going to be addressed? 
Yes, at least that's what Amazon is promising, that they, going forward, will look backwards and delete all of the offending information. For example, when it comes to the federal law prohibiting recording of children's voices, and definitely they'll go back and delete that information. As to some of the customer uh, video information from Ring, they're going to go back and address those concerns. But those promises are just that, a promise. People whose identities or their facial images may have been compromised really don't have any way of double checking on that. It's just an assurance by Amazon at this point, although there appears to be an additional promise to notify those who may have had their security breached. Whether or not or what form that will take uh, remains to be seen. Danny Savalos, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, for the first time ever, a NASA group is revealing publicly more information about all those potential UFO sightings. What has even some experts saying we're not so sure? Plus, Gerber looking for its next spokes baby. And this year, the contest is going to look a little different. We'll explain why in our five things. A new study is getting into how the shape of your brain affects how you think and feel and behave. We're going to get into that in the five things. But first, if the truth is out there... A NASA panel is apparently trying to find it, starting tonight to share publicly some of its work on UFOs. Talking about more than 800 times they looked at things that happened that raised the question, what is that? What are those? Are we really alone? This new inside look at their work comes ahead of a report a lot of folks are on pins and needles for later this summer that tries to explain sightings made by military pilots and guys with a telescope in the desert. Freaky videos like what you're looking at here. Right, that have raised questions. Is that a bird? Is that a plane? Is it a visitor from a planet far, far away? Or perhaps it is something a bit more pedestrian. Here's former military pilot and astronaut Scott Kelly on how even the most well-trained eyes can be deceived. My Rio thought, the guy that sits in the back of the Tomcat, was convinced we flew by a UFO. So I didn't see it. We turned around. We went to go look at it. It turns out it was Bart Simpson. A balloon. A BART balloon. There's your twist, right? Now, the Pentagon, they had their own version of this NASA research team, releasing a report a few months back, analyzing more than 500 of these so-called UAP reports with a lot of, oh, of course, explanations, coming to the conclusion that a lot of these things were drones, balloons, even floating plastic shopping bags. But, and ET enthusiasts' ears definitely pricked up at this. Look at that top number. They could not figure out what was the deal with more than 170 of these objects, leaving the door open to, I don't know, something else maybe? NBC's Aaron Gilchrist is covering this for us. So this fa- sort of interesting hearing today, I was like, okay, can't wait to see what this is all about. Yeah. It turns out it was like really sciency, which is not a bad thing, but it was like, it wasn't aliens, green, whatevers. It was like pretty um, living in the land of facts. Yeah, I think so. I mean, this, was, this yeah. was a group of some of the smartest people in the country. Brilliant people. Right, astrophysicists and oceanographers and astrobiologists. I didn't know there was an astrobiology, but and so these were people who, who, could, who could say, you know what, let's look at the science. And that's been the real big issue here, that these things have been spotted in the sky, and there's not been real uniformity around how to collect data and figure out exactly what we're looking at. So, so you know, the panel went so far out of the gate to, as to say there's no credible evidence of extraterrestrial life. Let's put the alien thing to the side for now. And, and I, they identified the problem as, you know, we need to have accessible, unclassified data that we can look at universally across different, you know, different organizations, different agencies, and st- start to sort of collect this information and analyze it in the same language so that they can come to some conclusions. At this point, there just isn't enough data out there to really come to conclusions. They also talked about the need for more and more data. I want you to, I want you to hear a little bit of what uh, was said about the idea of collecting more information. There's a real stigma among people reporting events. Commercial pilots, for example, are very reluctant to report anomalies. And one of our goals in having NASA play a role is to remove stigma and get high quality data. And so that's part of the reason that NASA is now a part of this conversation. You take the space agency and they're saying, you know what, let's take seriously these unidentified things that are out there. Don't be afraid to tell us that you saw something. 
and we come up with a, a language that we all speak where we can start to identify these Is things. the stigma, like they're trying to, to erase some of the stigma about reporting these weird things? Because I get that, right? Like you're some pilot, you're some expert in yeah. aerospace, and you're like, what's this weird thing? Maybe you don't want to say it. Is that why we're seeing like more and more transparency around this issue as they try to lift that stigma? Yeah, I think it's part of the effort to lift the stigma. And there's just been so much public interest as of late in, in these things, these unidentified uh, things that are popping up in the air now. hearings, the yeah. Pentagon, like everybody's talking about it now and before it was like the third rail. Right, you didn't want to talk about it, nobody took it seriously, right. and now we can take it seriously. But, you know, they also point out the fact that there are more than 800,000 registered drones in this country. Ah. There are weather balloons that the National Weather Service is putting up uh, more than 100 a day. And so there are lots of things that... If we had a little more data, we would be able to identify them. They wouldn't be unidentified phenomena. Let me just ask the big question then, though. For the stuff that we, and we've seen videos of some of this stuff, right? For the ones that aren't drones mm -hmm. or floating plastic shopping bags or a Bart Simpson balloon, what are they? I mean, that's the big question, right? That's uh, the unexplained is when we start to think, all right, well, is there something else out there that's oh, sending man. stuff in to our atmosphere or outer space? And and, you know, NASA is still, they're, they're still venturing out farther sure. and farther away to see if there is life beyond our solar You know system. who is salivating over this story? Gotti Schwartz. <laughs> he loves this stuff. Yeah. He's gonna have more if you like a little sci-fi, this is catnip for you. <laughs> Aaron Gilchrist, thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, just breaking this hour, we're getting word that actor Danny Masterson has been found guilty of two counts of rape. That 70s show star had been accused of sexually assaulting three women he met through the Church of Scientology. The jury agreed on two of the counts, but was deadlocked on a third. Number two, also breaking this hour, the Los Angeles DA has just announced they will not charge actor Army Hammer with sexual assault. That's after the LAPD presented evidence related to sex assault allegations made against the movie star back in 2021. The DA's office saying in a statement it doesn't have enough evidence to prove those allegations beyond a reasonable doubt. Statement yet. Number three, an update to a story we told you about 24 hours ago. Officials say that Tennessee woman who went missing on a cross-country trip with her boyfriend has now been found safe after she was seen at a Northern California parking lot. Police say her boyfriend had an outstanding warrant for his arrest in Tennessee and was taken into custody. Number four, the overall shape of your brain may have more to do with how you think than you might have thought before. New research shows that while scientists used to focus mostly on what was in your brain, all those little neural connections, they've now found a new link between the shape of your brain and different kinds of activity that could make it easier to predict how well and how specifically your brain works. How about that? Number five, Gerber launching its search for this year's Gerber spokes baby. You know, this has been an annual tradition for like two decades now. But this year, parents who send in a picture of your baby can submit one of your own baby pictures too. Parents have until June 10th to submit. The winning baby gets 25,000 bucks, a whole new wardrobe, and a year's supply of Gerber baby food. When we come back, the new car safety plan that could save hundreds of lives in car crashes every year. But does it go far enough? We're getting into it. New NBC News reporting on treatments for drug addiction during pregnancy and how shame, stigma, and the potential threat of babies being taken away from mothers stop a lot of women from getting help. We'll talk about the laws some doctors want to see changed a little bit later on this hour. But first, regulators today announcing a plan that will require automatic emergency braking on almost all cars down the road and trucks, by the way. It's something that they say could help save lives and cut back on the number of people hurt in car crashes. Because even though there's so many safety features in cars already, think about it, right? Seatbelts, airbags, et cetera. Car crashes are still the number one cause of premature death for people under the age of 54. I mean, it is, like, just think about that, right? 43,000 people died in car crashes last year. That is up 19% from 2019. Well, now the Department of Transportation says, hey, technology maybe can help change that. They say requiring car makers to sell cars with this automatic emergency brake technology could save at least 360 lives a year. That could basically it could save a life a day. And they say it would reduce the amount of people who are hurt from car crashes by at least 24,000 each year. Tom Costello is joining us now. We're talking about um, this this thing that if there is like a the car can sense if there's yeah. something in front of you and it'll automatically <clears throat> hit the brakes That's if right. you can't in time or you don't see it or what have you. Some cars already have this feature. This yep. would make all cars have it starting soon. Yeah, well, so I have it in my car. I've had it for two models now and it literally 
slams on the brakes like that if you get too close to the guy in front of you. I think it's too abrupt, actually. I'm always afraid somebody behind me is going to slam into the back of me. But right now, according to the government, 90% of cars, new cars, have this technology already. Now the government wants to make this mandatory. And in addition, they want to up the ante. And one of the things they want to do is make it so that the car recognizes a pedestrian in the crosswalk or wherever and that you don't hit the pedestrian. So I just, oh, okay, here's the braking system. Avoid collisions at up to 62 miles per hour. Right now it's about 30 miles per hour. They want to double that, right? Capable of stopping for pedestrians and then achieving this through software updates. And this is what they think the cost would be, 84 bucks more or less per vehicle. Okay, but again, about 90% of vehicles already have this. Now they want to up it, make it better. I talked to a pedestrian who was hit by a car in a crosswalk here in D.C., mm. ran right over him. Ugh. This is a 29-year-old kid who is considered to be a virtuoso cello player, and he suffered cardiac arrest, wow. multiple brain uh, bone injuries, and a brain injury. Listen to what he said to me. I was in the crosswalk when I was uh, struck by the vehicle. Um, and the only thing is, I remember it was um, raining at nighttime outside. The EMS uh, showed up and had to resuscitate me. Yeah, that's Benjamin Gates. And by the way, he calls out D.C. Fire Station 15 for saving his life. Wow. They did CPR, saved his life. This is a kid who was a phenomenal cello player. He now constant, struggles to concentrate and read the music because he was hit in a crosswalk by a hit-and-run driver. The idea is maybe this software upgrading and updating the this kind of system will prevent these types of accidents. So what's the timeline for that actually becoming a requirement? And yeah. what's the catch if there is one? Well, so the, the, the auto industry says we are already voluntarily going there and we will have it done by 25. And the government is saying, OK, yeah, but we want to require it and we want it better than what you guys are promising. So it would be three years after the rule is formally adopted. But as you know, this is Washington. It takes forever for rules to get made. So I think maximum you're talking three, four, five years. That's if Biden remains president, right? If you get a Republican president coming in, they could throw out the rule. That's also true. Uh, Tom Costello, thank you. Fascinating reporting and a great interview. Appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Coming up, new body cam video showing the wild moments that this car crashes into a tow truck, ends up in the air. We're going to tell you what happened to the driver later on. So tennis star Novak Djokovic is just winning his second round match at the French Open, but it's not only his game making headlines tonight. It's this moment we're about to show you right here that people are talking about. Look at that. In the competition, he's writing on, on a camera lens in Serbian, Kosovo is the heart of Serbia, weighing in on this really controversial debate that's been playing out over the independence of Kosovo. Ali Aruzi is joining us now live. This has put a new and sharp spotlight on what's happening in Kosovo, with Serbia, et cetera. Talk to us about why this has become so controversial with Novak Djokovic in the center of it in some ways. Well, Hallie, firstly, this is an age-old dispute going yeah. back centuries in a region of Serbia that they consider the heart of their statehood, religion, culture and identity. But Kosovo's majority of ethnic Albanians see it as their own country and they're accusing Serbia of occupation and repression. Now, Kosovo is a tiny country. It's the smallest country in the Balkans and it's been having problems for a long time. In 1913, it was incorporated into the Kingdom of Serbia, but tensions over religion and land persisted spilling into bloody conflicts. The modern Albanian-Serbian conflict has its roots in the expulsion of Albanians in 1877. So this has been going on for a long time between these two, and they keep flaring up and coming down uh, the tensions between them, uh, depending on what's going on. And this simmered through the 20th century occasionally erupting into violence until Kosovo declared independence from Serbia in 2008. Serbia didn't recognize it, although the U.S. and E.U. recognize it. And funnily enough, Russia is the country that's backing Serbia uh, against the West backing Kosovo. So it's a, it's a real mess, and that's why we've seen all of these tensions flare up again this week when, uh, when local elections uh, took place. The Serbs boycotted them. The Albanian Kosovo's got, a, got the election with only 4% of the vote. 
and then all hell broke loose in the region. NATO had to be called in, and there have been violent skirmishes between both sides. Uh, and now they're just hoping they're not going to have a repeat of the 1998 war that was, that was so, so divisive in that region and one of the most destabilizing post-World War II conflicts in Europe. Can you talk about the reaction to these comments from Djokovic inside the sports world, I mean, because it was, you know, fairly explosive for something like this? Uh, very. Look, the, the, the Kosovo Olympic Committee have condemned his comments. They said a sportsman shouldn't be making these comments. He should be sticking to tennis. And this is only going to be more divisive uh, for the current tensions in that region. The French uh, sports minister, who and France is going to be hosting the Olympics uh, next year, said that it wasn't appropriate for Djokovic to make these comments. But the Tennis Federation say he was well within his rights to say this. There are no rules stopping him from making these comments. Ali Aruzi, thank you so much. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, a New York OBGYN who's been accused of getting his patients pregnant with his own sperm has died in a plane crash. He was in a hand-built plane that fell apart during the flight and crashed, according to officials. They said the pilot was also killed, but the whole thing still under investigation. Out of our Southern Bureau, check out this moment caught on camera, right? This car. So watch the tow truck. A car comes by. It's there it is, launching off the tow truck, flipping over. The driver was hurt, ended up in the hospital. According to the incident report, officials say the tow truck driver, who was standing just a few feet away when this happened, is okay. Out of our Western Bureau, hundreds of Amazon workers walked out of the country's, uh, the company's headquarters in Seattle, I should say. This is just video into us for the last couple of hours. They were upset about things like layoffs, plans to return to office, what the company does to the environment. Amazon says in a statement, we respect our employees' rights to express their opinions. To an NBC News exclusive now, with doctors calling for changes to laws that make it illegal to use drugs during pregnancy, saying those laws can actually hurt instead of help moms and their babies. With the story, NBC is sharing of Brandi Williams, who'd been up for two straight days smoking crack cocaine when she realized she was going into labor. I want to quote here from this piece. As she walked through the doors to give birth to her daughter, Williams made one last preparation before delivery. She tossed her crack pipe into a trash can. So... Why wait to get clean? Doctors say laws are not really helping pregnant women who have a substance abuse addiction. There's this law called the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, which basically requires states to have a plan to address child abuse and neglect. Each state, in some ways, interprets that law a little bit differently. 25 states plus D.C. consider substance abuse during pregnancy to be child abuse. And yes, using drugs while you're pregnant, that is not good. But doctors say it's not easy to quit once somebody becomes addicted to opioids. And it's not always that pregnant women don't want to get help, they say. It's that they're afraid to get it, concerned their child may be taken away or that they could even face criminal charges. I want to bring in Erica Edwards, who's behind this exclusive in-depth reporting for us tonight at NBC News. Um, and Erica, we, we talked about the story of this one woman, Brandi Williams, that you used to sort of start and lay out your piece. It is a, in some ways, kind of shocking stories. And in some ways, and as the point of your reporting is, it is a story that happens again and again to women all over the country. Help us understand this issue here. Yeah, I mean, let's be real. Substance use overall has risen dramatically over the past decade or so. So it really should be no surprise that some women are using when they become pregnant. There are medications that can be used safely during pregnancy to help women stop using without long-term effects uh, on the baby. But at least 25 states right now Consider substance use during pregnancy, even those drugs meant to help curb those cravings, um, as child abuse. And so they require doctors to report those women to state health care authorities. And that really means that most pregnant women who, who are using would rather just sort of deal on this issue on their own than get help. So what are doctors that you're talking to saying? Because there's this issue of shame and stigma around, stigma rather, around trying to get help, as you point out. So some of these doctors, they, they're demanding change in some ways. 
Yeah, I mean, this is really shocking because this is the number one cause of preventable death when it comes to pregnant or postpartum women is drug overdose. And I've talked with multiple people who are maternal fetal uh, experts, who are health um, care uh, authorities, who are addiction authorities. They're all calling for these state laws to be um, to, to be overturned. Um, the system that we've built uh, is centered really among pre along pre prenatal care, which is important. But after a woman gives birth, that's when these risks really skyrocket. There is often just one postpartum doctor's visit, you know, six weeks after a woman gives birth. So interactions with doctors pretty much stop just when moms who really, who use drugs are most vulnerable. They are compelled to keep using without much help. Erica Edwards uh, behind that reporting for us tonight here at NBC News. Erica, thank you so much. If you or somebody you know is struggling with substance abuse, there is help. You can call 1-800-662-HELP. You see the number right there on screen. Still to come here on the show, Yeezy sneakers are back on sale even months after Adidas cut ties with the rapper formerly known as Kanye West. What we know about plans, what Adidas plans to do with the profits. Wait do you hear this. That's next. So Yeezy shoes back on sale today, months after Adidas cut ties with Ye, the rapper formerly known as Kanye West because of his racist and anti-Semitic rants. He had some sneaker heads who were like, okay, let me see, can I snag one of these last pairs of these shoes here? There's like millions of dollars worth of these shoes that are out there. That's after Adidas split with Ye late last year. So this question now, what do you do with the leftover inventory? That was a big one. The CEO of Adidas saying that after careful consideration, they decided to sell what they have. What are they going to do with the profits? They're going to donate some of it to anti-racism organizations. How much? Well, still a question mark. Adidas will also reportedly have to pay royalties to Ye under the terms of his contract. Brian Chung is joining us now. This is this was such an explosive thing when it happened, right? I mean, beyond just the sort of awfulness of the rants that were anti-Semitic, racist from Ye, there was like this business nexus here with Adidas that came under fire for not distancing itself from Ye sooner. Um, now they're releasing the sneakers, the shoes. How was the release? Like, was there a lot of interest in it? What's the deal? Yeah, well, I'm looking right now on the app where you actually purchase it. It seems like some of these items are actually sold out, and they've been kind of releasing them slowly across the day. And it's not all the inventory that they unloaded today. They're going to be doing it uh, kind of in, in increments uh, over time. But for what it's worth, it seems like they're selling out on some of these if you're willing to pay $230 for a pair of shoes or $70 for a pair of slides. But either way, as you mentioned, the proceeds will not be going to Ye. That's because they terminated their business relationship with him in October. But they did say that that a significant amount of the proceeds will be going to, as you mentioned, some of those organizations that combat discrimination and hate, like the Anti-Defamation League. Although when they say significant amount, that does also imply that Adidas is going to pocket some of that money as well. That's right. What is the profit share? We don't really know. We'll have to see if they offer any more details as they continue to do these sales, Allie. It's not like they were trying to sneak this quietly under the radar, right? I mean, Adidas leaned into the release here. They put a countdown clock up online, you know what I mean? Just like they would for any other sneaker release here. Yeah, they did. But what's really interesting is that we didn't know if they would release these sneakers at all. So I've been, you know, right. interestingly watching this story well, for some time. Well, you are a sneaker person. I People am a sneaker should know, person. Full disclosure. It, yes. Absolutely. You can't see what I'm wearing right now. But look, at the end of the day, there was a talking point that maybe Adidas was going to have to just simply dump all yeah. these sneakers into a landfill, which, by the way, there's a clothing line as well that they were potentially just going to have to scrap. Ultimately, they decided to sell it to the general public. But again, do this profit sharing. So maybe they can make a few cents on the dollar here. But either way, you cut it a slice. It. There seems to be some demand for all of this, but again, who knows what the sales numbers are and how much Adidas is making off of this. And, and what is an impact on their bottom line? Is it negligible? Is it significant here? Do we know yet? Yeah, well, the company said that it could cost them up to 700 million U.S. dollars, this whole debacle, mm. depending on how the sales of this go. I imagine that they'll be offering more details and updates through the other quarterly reports as they continue to try to sell through this inventory. But there's some estimates out there, Hallie, that they have over a billion dollars in inventory that they'll have to sell through. And I I think there's only 20 or 30 styles on the site right now, so it's going to take them some time. Brian Chung, thank you very much. Interesting stuff. Appreciate it. That does it for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now.
coming on the air tonight as it's about to go down here in Washington with the House set to vote on a plan that could avoid the potential default disaster if the government can't pay its bills on time. We've got the latest on the moves that may end up getting made late tonight. And then there were nine. That's how many candidates are about to be officially in the Republican presidential primary. We'll tell you the two big names, spoiler, who are going to get into the race. Plus, do you have a ring doorbell at your house? What about Alexa? Turns out Amazon is now settling because they may be violating you and your kids' privacy. The pushback from Amazon and the big fines they're paying out. Then Novak Djokovic serving up a political message at the French Open. We'll tell you how his comments on Kosovo and Serbia are creating some controversy now. Plus, breaking as we have been on the air, you know that 70s show star Danny Masterson, a jury just finding him guilty of rape. We're live from L.A. with the reaction from inside court. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight we are getting ready for a super important vote on the House floor that we think is going to come in the next couple of hours that could make sure that this country is able to pay its bills on time and avoid a global financial catastrophe. But that is only if the House of Representatives greenlights this deal. A lot of members are a yes. Some of them are a no. The devil, as always, in the details. Speaker McCarthy not saying exactly where the numbers stand tonight, although we're keeping our own count. We'll get to that in a second. And the speaker, who, of course, negotiated this agreement with President Biden to make sure the country makes good on what it owes, well, the speaker seems confident. Today, the American people are going to win. We're going to pass the largest cut in American history. It's just a small step putting us on the right track. So now tonight, tea leaves looking good in the House for those who read them. And that means the spotlight is shifting to the Senate, where senators there will only have four days to get their side of things taken care of before this so-called X date, June 5th. That's when the Treasury says we'll basically crash into a brick wall and default on the debt we owe. That could throw the entire world into a huge economic meltdown. That's not me speculating that. That's the actual risk here. And it's those stakes bringing together two people who we almost never see brought together in the Senate, the top Democrat and the top Republican. Watch. I cannot stress enough that we have no margin, no margin for error. When this agreement reaches the Senate, I'll be proud to support it without delay. I want to bring in Sahil Kapoor, who's covering all of this for us on Capitol Hill. So, Sahil, bottom line, at, let's say, midnight tonight, do we think the House will have passed this and put the ball in the Senate's court? Is that the expectation? That is the expectation, Hallie. The bill appears to be in good shape to pass the House in the next couple of hours. We got a, a, reasonable, uh, a reasonably good hint at this at the rule vote that just a couple of hours ago passed comfortably with a lot of Republicans and a few Democrats. Now, my best crystal ball reading, if I'm trying to do that, is there will be fewer Republicans than the rule vote uh, on the final passage of the bill, and there'll be more Democrats who didn't vote for the rule vote. That's procedural. It's usually the majority that carries it through. That was the expectation. But there are more Democrats who support the bill on the merits. Uh, the question is uh, how high the, the number goes, which could have an impact on uh, what the final count is in the Senate as well. One of the uh, big through lines in this entire drama, Hallie, has been whether Speaker McCarthy can pull this off, cut a deal with the president, keep his hardliners at bay, and maintain his job, maintain that speaker's gavel. Remember, any one Republican can call to force a vote to overthrow him at any time. McCarthy sounds very confident. Let's play what he had to say. Are you worried about a challenge to your speakership? Not at all. Why should I? They have the ability to do that. They're not worried they have the ability every day to do that. And there is some justification for that confidence, Hallie. Several of the Republican hardliners who I spoke to last night who are voting against this bill say they're not currently thinking about uh, overthrowing the speaker. That includes Ken Buck. That includes, includes Keith Self. They're trying to keep these two things separate right now, in part because they don't have an alternative. And they saw what happens when you keep trying to stop him, uh, when you try to yeah. keep trying to beat something with nothing. Okay, so what I hear you say is that, you know, the House likely to wrap things up, put a bow on it, set it aside, their end of the deal. That means things shift over to the Senate. And in the last couple of minutes, we've heard Senator Mike Lee, Republican senator on the House, uh, on the Senate floor, excuse me, call this a deal from hell. Now, fine, if right, he, he's going to lodge a complaint. Other senators may lodge their complaints or their concerns about this deal. Will any of them actually try to slow it down enough that we could miss that June 5th deadline? In other words, in the Senate, it only takes one senator to slow the train down on the tracks. Is that where we're headed there? 
That is the fear in the Senate of proponents of this bill, Hallie. It's likely to have the 60 votes it needs once it finally comes to that vote uh, and ultimately pass the Senate. The question is, is that four to five days enough before that June 5th X date deadline, and in the Senate, it could take up to seven days to pass a piece of legislation without consent. The key is, especially on the right, the Mike Lees, the Rand Pauls, uh, they are making demands. They want to have an amendment. You know, they want to make changes to the bill. Usually, uh, in many cases, the way this ends up working is that the leadership of both parties grants them a vote on an amendment, and they reach a time agreement. It's not entirely clear that that's how it's going to work out, but that is the best case scenario here because these uh, conservative senators are not going to back down. And by the way. It's not just Republicans uh, who are opposing this bill. There will be some opposition from right. the progressive, progressive the Democrats. As, yeah, exactly. From some progressive Democrats, there is Senator Bernie Sanders, a progressive uh, independent caucuses with Democrats, put out a statement uh, vociferously opposing this bill. He worries it'll increase uh, hunger. He worries it'll promote fossil fuels through the uh, fossil fuel consumption through the Mountain Valley pipeline. Yet a, a whole bunch of other reasons we may see additional progressives vote against it. But again, at the end of the day, this is likely to get the votes. That The key here for Chuck Schumer, the majority leader, and Mitch McConnell, the minority leader, will be to get a time agreement and a process uh, that gets this done quickly because they don't have much time. We will follow that as it develops. Sahil Kapoor, thank you much. We're going to have continuing coverage tonight right here on NBC News Now. I'll probably see you later tonight for that. Thanks. So if two is company and three is a crowd, then what is nine? That's how many official candidates there are about to be in the Republican primary. With NBC News learning tonight that former Vice President Mike Pence and former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie are about to get in that 2024 race. You've got Pence set to do it in Iowa, according to sources. Christie, sources say, in New Hampshire. We'll come back to those locations in a second. And these are both men with very real links to the current frontrunner in the Republican race, Donald Trump. Pence was obviously his VP, loyal to him. The two, of course, split over Mr. Trump's push to overturn the legitimate 2020 election results. You had Christie, who backed Donald Trump back in 2016 after it became clear Christie wasn't going to win himself. Christie ran his White House transition for a blink of an eye moment before getting cut out of the inner circle and eventually speaking out more vociferously against Donald Trump's leadership. You have Mr. Trump already on the campaign trail in Iowa. You see some of those stops here in red. The blue, those are the stops for the person considered his most serious competitor at this point, Florida Republican Governor Ron DeSantis. Our Dasha Burns is joining us now from Council Bluffs, Iowa. Okay, Dasha, talk about the Pence of it all, if you will, because he's putting a lot of his political eggs into the sort of state basket behind you there. Iowa, a big focus for him. Talk us through strategy and thinking here. Yeah, the Hawkeye State is probably where Pence has his best shot, Hallie. Look, this is a state with a huge population of religious evangelical voters. That is uh, a huge part of the Republican Party where Pence thinks he has a shot at chipping away at Trump's base. That's where he's going to make his play here. And his campaign plans to visit all 99 counties in Iowa. This will be sort of a Midwest brand of politics, town hall style meetings, uh, drop by sessions at restaurants of a of, of very sort of intimate retail style campaign, which is very much what Iowa voters are looking for. But of course, we've seen the polls. He's not doing so hot right now. So there is a, a long road ahead for uh, the former vice president here in Iowa and beyond, actually, Hallie. Well, for sure. Um, you know, it's interesting here, too. So we talked about sort of the Pence of it all. There's also the Christie of it all as well, because yeah. the state of New Hampshire, which is another important state that I know you'll be spending a lot of time in, kind of crushed his campaign dreams back in 2016. When I was covering yeah. him, he finished sixth there. Obviously, New Hampshire is going to be central to his campaign coming up. We expect him to be holding this town hall there to kick off his campaign. What is the Christie path to victory here, Dasha? And what are the broader concerns among some in the party about having such a big field, a la 2016 to a degree, when Donald Trump is again the front runner here? Yeah, it's a really great question. What is the path? I'm not sure what it is for Christie right now. I mean, he also witnessed 2016. He was one of the few folks that are joining in now uh, who were there in 2016. And he actually said in a town hall a couple of months ago that he thinks that the strategy was wrong from the candidates in 2016, holding the fire on Trump early on, thinking, oh, we'll just get past uh, these next few rounds and we'll hold the fire until there's a small 
field. He is going to be the guy that jumps in and takes Trump head on. I think he's been watching the growing field of candidates and seeing folks sort of pulling their punches. Tim Scott, Nikki Haley and others not really going after the former president. And he thinks that's a mistake. So he, he's going to jump into the race. It's a long shot. I think he knows that. But he will likely change the dynamics just by that fact alone that it's going to be disruptive in that he's going to do what the other candidates aren't doing and really uh, take a much harsher, much more direct approach when it comes to the former president. Will that work in terms of getting his poll numbers or uh, any higher, his unfavorables any lower? Maybe, maybe not. Will that change his brand? Maybe. And will that change the dynamic and, you know, perhaps harm Trump a little bit? I think maybe that in and of itself is the goal there, Hallie. Dasha Burns live for us there in Iowa. Dasha, thank you. Convicted double murderer Alec Murdoch back in court today for the first time since being sentenced for killing his wife and son. This time, he's showing up to plead not guilty to new federal charges he's facing connected to alleged financial crimes. I want to show you his attorneys arriving at the courthouse earlier today as Murdoch is facing 22 federal charges, including bank fraud, money laundering, and more. According to this indictment, he was part of an alleged plan to swindle his clients out of money from 2005 till 2021 when Murdoch was arrested on state charges. He's already serving a life sentence for killing his wife, Maggie, and son, Paul, that year. The result of a six-week trial that was being called the South's trial of the century. Laura Jarrett joins me now. So, Laura, Murdoch's attorney says in a statement his client is cooperating and that they're confident these charges can be resolved quickly without a trial. What's the likelihood of that? Yeah, I think, Hallie, that appears to be where this is going, uh, mm. at least according to Murdoch's attorneys. They told our NBC affiliate there in court today, a bunch of reporters told them they expect a change of plea hearing to happen, Sue. I think, so I think the writing is on the wall, but his legal troubles, as you laid out, are far from over. And we haven't heard from the Justice Department about what they intend to do here and whether they would actually agree to such a plea and what the terms of it might look like. Uh, as you mentioned, he's uh, facing a slew of new charges charges here, everything from money laundering, wire fraud. It all boils down to this idea of accusations that he stole from his clients and that he also took the settlement money to the tune of almost $4 million from the estate of a, a housekeeper that worked in his home for years. Her death was somewhat mysterious at his home. And so the idea there was that, um, obviously, he had swindled them, them out of this money, something he has denied. But we'll see where this change of plea goes if, in fact, it happens. This indictment says that Murdoch got help from another former attorney and, and friend of his who pleaded guilty to similar charges last week. So take that. Take the fact that Murdoch is already sentenced yeah. for murder. Like, does that complicate things for him here? Well, I think certainly the plea from his associate makes it harder um, for him to fight these charges. And, uh, you know, again, he's already behind bars. And so there's been a little bit of a question about why would the feds do this? What's in their interest? Why spend the time and resources on it? Uh, Perhaps they were looking for more information and needed this as leverage to get something out of him. He's also facing almost 100 state charges on these very same financial crimes. Again, something that he has denied, although he did admit to a fair amount of it on the stand in that double murder trial. Uh, mm. So we'll see where all of this goes. But the, at the end of the day, he's going to be behind bars for a very long time. Laura Jarrett, thank you very much. Elsewhere in South Carolina, we're learning new details about the store owner charged with the murder of a 14-year-old who police say he wrongly accused of stealing. Richland County Sheriff's Department releasing a report on incidents Rick Chow has been involved in from 2015 to 2018. The department says apparently they've gotten hundreds of calls from his store, ranging from claims of assaults, larceny, shoplifting, and more. Cyrus Carmack Belton, you see him here, he had just graduated from the eighth grade when this all happened. There is now anger that is building in this community, including from South Carolina Congressman Jim Clyburn, who says the criminalization of black men and boys has once again led to deadly and heartbreaking circumstances. Here's what we know so far, that Carmack Belton went into the store that you see here, right? It's near this gas station in Columbia, right around 8 o'clock Sunday night. Police say that Chow thought that Carmack Belton stole some bottles of water, four of them. At some point, they get into an argument along with Chow's son. Then Carmack Belton takes off running. They chase him. Eventually, police say Chow shot him in the back. Sam Brock is joining us now. So, Sam, a lot of information that we're just getting in from police here. Walk us through it and specifically two incidents that the department points out. 
Yeah, Hallie, really within the last hour, we just heard yeah. from Richland County Sheriff's Department, and we're talking hundreds. They don't specify how many, which speaks to the fact that this gas station convenience store apparently was a hot spot for a hotbed for criminal activity. You listed some of the charges they put in there, everything from larceny to burglary, shoplifting, motor vehicle theft. So with that as a backdrop, let's look at a couple of the incidents that they specified involving this same guy, Rick Chow. First, we start with 2015. And this includes a confrontation with a guy who apparently just tried to steal an easy off degreaser can that cost about six or seven bucks. He confronts him and ends up shooting that man. Um, and then this is actually the 2015 example, which was even worse. In 2015, there was a woman that tried to steal, according to the police report, beer and peanuts. So he tries to stop her. She goes outside, gets into a car, and he takes out his Glock 45 Halley and shoots six times at the car. Now, is this really representative of the fact this is someone who is combustible or has been preyed upon by this community in terms of just people trying to steal stuff from his store? We don't know. But as it concerns this 14-year-old teenager, he was accused, at least authorities believe Chow thought, he was stealing four bottles of water, which it turns out, according to surveillance video, there was nothing to support that whatsoever. And as a result, this 14-year-old teenager now is going to be having a funeral in a few days, and his family in this community is overwrought with grief and trying to understand how this is even possible. You know, what I think is important to point out here, too, and you have, Sam, but the police say there's no evidence that Carmack Belton stole anything or that he yeah. threatened Chow or his son. And by the way, that is also not a... If that were to have happened, like, right? Right. You, you don't get shot. For, like, that, that, is not a, that is not a penalty under law that happens here, right? Um, no. It, the, the anger from people, and I know you've talked about it, but that seems so central here. Are we hearing from the family? What are we hearing? What happens to Chow next year? What else do we know? Well, what's pretty apparent is that the family is close, or at least knows, both the coroner, who has spoken out passionately, and also mm. a state representative, who says that this is just a predictable pattern of prejudice. And he talked about the fact that this sort of, of racial profiling almost always affects black communities and ends up with someone being shot down, he said in his words, like a dog in the street. Now, as far as the coroner that I just mentioned, she did get very emotional in an Instagram post, describing yeah. not seeing any signs on this teenager's body uh, of a physical confrontation, any abrasions, mm. just running away and being shot in the back. Listen to a portion of her post right now, and you tell me if that hits home for you. I have a son who is that age. Mm. I have a son that age. He could be my son. Do you guys understand that he could be any of our kids? It makes me emotional. It makes me angry. Hallie, the murder charges came less than a day after the shooting took place. And yet the community still, seeing that the wheels of justice were turning, at least to this point, vandalized the gas station and that convenience store out of clearly anguish and frustration. And, you know, there are calls right now for that sort of activity not to continue to happen. Okay. But it's pretty evident that there's deep buried anguish here right now in Columbia, South Carolina. Sam Brock, thank you very much for covering this important story. You got it. We've got some new details on another key story tonight from Iowa, where we're just learning in the last couple of hours here that the owner of that now-collapsed apartment building in Davenport is being accused of violating safety rules and could show up in court just about a week from now. That's as rescuers are racing against the clock to find anybody who may still be inside what you're looking at, this building that obviously partially collapsed. You see it. You see what happened to it. Firefighters went in and found several pets, they say, but no people in a dangerous search with the building still shifting and crumbling as they look. Just 24 hours ago, we told you about the search to find two people believed to possibly still be inside with five people in all unaccounted for. Right now, still just questions, no answers, just questions about where those folks are. And people in Davenport are angry. They're protesting outside this building, putting up signs saying, find them first because there was a plan that would have had the building torn down, at least until a woman was found alive in it less than 48 hours ago. Our team on the ground talking with her family after she was trapped for 24 hours. Watch. She was in a tub with a pillow and blanket the whole time. She said she didn't hear not an ambulance or a fire truck. Ow. And they did not come and kick in that door to find her.
I want to bring in Shaq Brewster, who is live for us in Davenport, Iowa. Um, Shaq, this new citation against the building owner is significant because of these questions of accountability. I know that you and I have talked about this. Maggie Vespa and I have talked about this. Who failed people here? That This may bring us a step closer to that answer. That's right, Hallie, and those questions continue. I want to bring up the language that we heard in that citation that was filed by the city. This was filed, by the way, yesterday, Hallie. They did not mention this during their press conference. But in that citation, they say, on or about May 28th, 2023, at 5 p.m., the defendant failed to maintain his building in a safe, sanitary, and structurally sound condition. They go on to say in another part of that citation that every owner is responsible for making sure that their buildings are kept in that condition. But the big thing here, Hallie, and this is against Andrew Wald, the owner of this building, that same citation says if he is convicted, the damages that the city is seeking, or are, that the city um, is seeking uh, for this violation, uh, amount to $400. That's not me misspeaking, Hallie. It's $400, 400 uh, if he is convicted here in this specific area. But city officials do say they do plan to have a state-led investigation. They are assembling that team, but we just haven't gotten any update from city officials yet, Hallie. Jack Brewster, live for us in Davenport. Obviously, uh, quite loud there still tonight with that wind blowing. Shaq, thank you very much. We've got some breaking news into us tonight. A Los Angeles jury finding after Danny Masterson guilty of two counts of rape, after this jury deliberated for something like a week, they were deadlocked on a third count. We're learning that inside the courtroom, Masterson, you see him here, he was uh, one of the stars of that 70s show. He was taken out in handcuffs as his wife was in tears, family and friends standing in silence. Masterson was accused of sexually assaulting three women two decades ago. He apparently met them through the Church of Scientology. This was his second trial on these charges after the first ended in a mistrial. I want to bring in Dana Griffin now. Dana, bring us up to speed here. So, Hallie, we have yet to hear from a representative for Masterson. We're hoping to get a statement soon. But this all stems from that 2020 arrest where Masterson was accused of raping three women, including a former longtime girlfriend, all members of the Church of Scientology. And this is the retrial, as you mentioned. That first trial ended in a mistrial. But here we have the two counts of felony rape. And on that third count uh, that involved Jane Doe three, that was declared a mistrial here. The 47-year-old pleaded not guilty to those three counts and says that he is innocent. And this case really stemmed around the drugging element of this case that was not introduced during that first trial in 2022, where it, in, it resulted in a mistrial. This time, the judge allowed the evidence and testimony about the women being drugged. And that may be reason why the jury found him guilty, at least on those two counts. They've been deliberating since May 17th, nearly two weeks. And today we have that final result. Masterson has been out on bail since 2020, but today the judge remanded him back to court. Well, he will stay until August 4th, until August 4th, when sentencing occurs. He faces up to 30 years to life in prison, Hallie. What about um, the victims? What are we hearing from them, especially after that one charge that ended in a deadlock, apparently? So I've got a statement here for you, and this results, this came from two of the victims. One we have from Jane Doe, too. She, she writes... I am experiencing a complex array of emotions, relief, exhaustion, strength, sadness, knowing that my abuser, Danny Masterson, will face accountability for his criminal behavior. I am disappointed that he has he was not convicted on all counts. We also got a statement from Jane Doe 3, who was Masterson's longtime girlfriend. She said, while I am encouraged that Danny Masterson will face some criminal punishment, I am devastated that he has dodged criminal accountability for his heinous conduct against me. She also added that she plans to continue her fight towards justice in criminal court, or excuse me, in civil court. Hallie? Dana Griffin, live for us there from L.A. Dana, thank you very much. Coming up, those huge wildfires in Canada are now triggering warnings here in the U.S. We're going to explain in the five things. Plus, hundreds of people flocking to a small town in Missouri to see a nun's dead body. Why some are calling what's happening there a miracle. Coming up in our five things, the surprising return to the Sex and the City spinoff. We'll tell you which character is making a comeback in a big way. But first, if the truth is out there, a NASA panel is apparently trying to find it, starting tonight to share publicly some of its work on UFOs. 
talking about more than 800 times they looked at things that happened that raised the question, what is that? What are those? Are we really alone? This new inside look at their work comes ahead of a report a lot of folks are on pins and needles for later this summer that tries to explain sightings made by military pilots and guys with a telescope in the middle of the desert. Freaky videos like the ones you're looking at. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it a visitor from a planet far, far away? Perhaps it's something a bit more pedestrian. Here's former astronaut Scott Kelly on how even the most well-trained eyes can be deceived. My Rio thought, the guy that sits in the back of the Tomcat, was convinced we flew by a UFO. So I didn't see it. We turned around. We went to go look at it. It turns out it was Bart Simpson, a balloon. Well, the Pentagon had their own version of this NASA research team, releasing a report a few months back analyzing some 500 of those so-called UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Reports, with a lot of, like, oh, of course, explanations, coming to the conclusion that a lot of this stuff were drones. Maybe they were balloons, even floating plastic shopping bags or birds. But look at that top number there. They could not figure out what the deal was with more than 170 of those objects, which leaves the door open to, I don't know, something else. NBC's Aaron Gilchrist joins me now. So this sort of interesting hearing today, I was like, OK, can't wait to see what this is all about. Yeah. It turns out it was like really sciencey, which is not a bad thing, but it was like it wasn't aliens, green, whatevers. It was like pretty um, living in the land of fact. Yeah, I think so. I so mean, fun. this was this yeah. was a group of some of the smartest people in the country. Brilliant people. Right. Astrophysicists and oceanographers and astrobiologists. I didn't know there was an astrobiology. But and so these were people who, who could who could say, you know what, let's look at the science. And that's been the real big issue here that these things have been spotted in the sky and there's not been real uniformity around how to collect data and figure out exactly what we're looking at. So, so you know, the panel went so far out of the gate to, as to say there's no credible evidence of extraterrestrial life. Let's put the alien thing to the side for now. And, and I, they identified the problem as, you know, we need to have accessible, unclassified data that we can look at universally across different, you know, different organizations, different agencies, and st start to sort of collect this information and analyze it in the same language so that they can come to some conclusions. At this point, there just isn't enough data out there to really come to conclusions. They also talked about the need for more and more data. I want you to, I want you to hear a little bit of what uh, was said about the idea of collecting more information. There's a real stigma among people reporting events. Commercial pilots, for example, are very reluctant to report anomalies. And one of our goals in having NASA play a role is to remove stigma and get high quality data. And so that's part of the reason that NASA is now a part of this conversation. You take the space agency and they're saying, you know what, let's take seriously these unidentified things that are out there. Don't be afraid to tell us that you saw something and we come up with a, a language that we all speak where we can start to identify. These is things. the stigma like they're trying to, to erase some of the stigma about reporting these weird things? Because I get that, right? Like you're some pilot, you're some expert in yeah. aerospace and you're like, what's this weird thing? Maybe you don't want to say it. Is that why we're seeing like more and more transparency around this issue as they try to lift that stigma? Yeah, I think it's part of the effort to lift the stigma and there's just been so much public interest as of late in in these things these unidentified uh things that are popping up in the air now. hearings the yeah. pentagon like everybody's talking about it now and before it was like the third rail right you didn't want to talk about it nobody took it seriously right. and now we can take it seriously but you know they also point out the fact that there are more than eight hundred thousand registered drones in this country ah. there are weather balloons that the national weather service is putting up uh, more than 100 a day and so there are lots of things that if we had a little more data, we would be able to identify them. They wouldn't be unidentified phenomena. Let me just ask the big question then, though. For the stuff that we, and we've seen videos of some of this stuff, right? For the ones that aren't drones mm -hmm. or floating plastic shopping bags or a Bart Simpson balloon, what are they? I mean, that's the big question, right? That's uh, the unexplained is when we start to think, all right, well, is there something else out there that's oh, sending man. stuff in to our atmosphere or outer space? And and, you know, NASA is still, they're, they're still venturing out farther sure. and farther away to see if there is life beyond our solar system. You know system. who is salivating over this story? Gotti Schwartz. He <laughs> loves this stuff. Yeah. He's gonna have more if you like a little sci-fi, this is catnip for you. <laughs> Aaron Gilchrist, thank you. Yeah. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, smoke from those huge wildfires in Canada 
now triggering air quality alerts across the border here in the U.S. Officials in Nova Scotia say about three fires are still burning out of control. The biggest has actually gotten even bigger, now something like 2,000 acres. They're banning any activity in the woods until further notice there. Number two, an update to a story we told you about 24 hours ago. Officials say that Tennessee woman who went missing on a cross-country trip with her boyfriend has now been found safe after a sighting at a Northern California parking lot. She was seen there. Police say her boyfriend had an outstanding arrest warrant in Tennessee. He's been taken into custody. Number three, hundreds of people are flocking to a little Missouri town to view the body of a nun. Why? Because her body has barely decomposed since she died in 2019. She was exhumed last month, four years after she was buried without embalming in a simple wooden casket. According to Catholic doctrine, she is not eligible for possible sainthood until five years after death. While some think that that is a sign of holiness, others say the lack of decomposition is not all that rare. Number four, NASA's James Webb Telescope, just capturing a picture of one of Saturn's icy moons billowing out a whole bunch of water vapor. So that's giving scientists a glimpse into how this moon feeds water into those iconic Saturn rings. Pretty interesting. Number five, a new report from Variety shows somebody coming back to the Sex in the City reboot or sequel. Kim Cattrall coming back. Samantha Jones in the season two finale of And Just Like That. It's only apparently one scene. She basically got written out as a character in the first season. She played Sam for years in Sex and the City. She did both movies, but said she didn't want to do a third one. There have been rumors for years about a rift between her and Sarah Jessica Parker. When we come back, some breaking news. We found out the jury has just reached a verdict in that family feud murder trial. We're going to tell you what it is coming up next. Plus, an NBC News exclusive. Why some doctors are trying to decriminalize using drugs during pregnancy. To an NBC News exclusive now, with some doctors calling for changes to laws that criminalize drug use during pregnancy, saying that those laws actually hurt instead of help moms and their babies. Take the story of Brandi Williams, who had been up for two straight days smoking crack cocaine when she realized she was going into labor. As our story puts it, as she walked through the doors to give birth to her daughter, Williams made one last preparation before delivery. She tossed her crack pipe into a trash can. Doctors say laws criminalizing drug use during pregnancy are not really, some of these doctors say it's not really helping women who have a substance addiction. It's a law called the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, which basically requires states to have a plan to address child abuse and neglect. Each state kind of interprets the law differently. About half of states, plus D.C., consider substance abuse during pregnancy to be child abuse. Now, yes, using drugs while you're pregnant, that is not good. But some doctors say it is not easy to quit once somebody's addicted to opioids. And they say it's not always that pregnant women don't want to get help. It's that they're afraid to get it, concerned that their child may be taken away or that they could even face criminal charges. I want to bring in Erica Edwards now, who broke this exclusive reporting. Um, and Erica, we, we talked about the story of this one woman, Brandy Williams, that you used to sort of start and lay out your piece. It is a, in some ways, kind of shocking stories. And in some ways, and as the point of your reporting is, it is a story that happens again and again to women all over the country. Help us understand this issue here. Yeah, I mean, let's be real. Substance use overall has risen dramatically over the past decade or so. So it really should be no surprise that some women are using when they become pregnant. There are medications that can be used safely during pregnancy to help women stop using without long-term effects uh, on the baby. But at least 25 states right now consider substance use during pregnancy, even those drugs meant to help curb those cravings um, as child abuse. And so they require doctors to report those women to state health care authorities. And that really means that most pregnant women who, who are using would rather just sort of deal on this issue on their own than get help. So what are doctors that you're talking to saying? Because there's this issue of shame and stigma around, stigma rather, around trying to get help, as you point out. So some of these doctors, they, they're demanding change in some ways. 
Yeah, I mean, this is really shocking because this is the number one cause of preventable death when it comes to pregnant or postpartum women is drug overdose. And I've talked with multiple people who are maternal fetal uh, experts, who are health um, care uh, authorities, who are addiction authorities. They're all calling for these state laws to be um, to, to be overturned. Um, the system that we've built uh, is centered really among pre along pre prenatal care, which is important. But after a woman gives birth, that's when these risks really skyrocket. There is often just one postpartum doctor's visit, you know, six weeks after a woman gives birth. So interactions with doctors pretty much stop just when moms who really who use drugs are most vulnerable. They are compelled to keep using without much help. Erica Edwards uh, behind that reporting for us tonight here at NBC News. Erica, thank you so much. If you or somebody you know is struggling with substance abuse, there is help. You can call 1-800-662-HELP. You see the number right there on screen. Coming up, it's being called an almost impossible mission. The moment a climber was rescued from a so-called Mount Everest death zone. Plus, a lot of people are talking about Novak Djokovic, but not because of his win at the French Open in one of the rounds. Why one Olympic committee wants disciplinary action against him in our original tonight. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight, Novak Djokovic has just won his second round match at the French Open, but it's not only his game making headlines. It's this moment right here. We're showing it you now. That's what people are talking about. Earlier in the competition where he writes in Serbian on a camera lens, Kosovo is the heart of Serbia. Making his opinion known on this controversial debate that's been playing out over Kosovo's independence. Ali Aruzi explains. Controversy today at the French Open. Serbian tennis superstar Novak Djokovic stepping into the fray, delivering a message about ongoing tensions in Kosovo during the Grand Slam tournament. Writing on a camera lens that Kosovo is the heart of Serbia. Stop the violence. And then saying, this is the least he could do because he feels responsible as a public figure to give support, especially as the son of a man who was born in Kosovo. Djokovic weighing in on a dispute stretching back centuries in a region that Serbia considers the heart of its statehood and religion. But Kosovo's majority of ethnic Albanians see it as their own country and accuse Serbia of occupation and repression. Kosovo is the smallest country in the Balkans and completely landlocked, bordered by Serbia to the north and east, North Macedonia to the south, Albania to the west, and Montenegro to the northwest. In 1913, it was incorporated into the Kingdom of Serbia, but tensions over religion, land, and ethnicity persisted, spilling over into bloody conflicts. Kosovo declared independence from Serbia in 2008, Although recognized by the United States and major European Union countries, Serbia, backed by its powerful ally Russia, refuses to do so, as do most ethnic Serbs inside Kosovo. Renewed tensions flared up again this week after Kosovo Serbs boycotted local elections in April, allowing ethnic Albanians to take control of local councils with a turnout of less than 4%. After the newly elected mayors attempted to take office, Serb residents sought to block them. Kosovan police then moved to escort the politicians past protesters, leading to clashes. NATO, who already had some 4,000 troops on the ground in Kosovo, deployed an extra 700 troops, some of whom clashed with Serb protesters in the north, where there's been unrest over the installation of ethnic Albanian mayors. NATO has condemned as totally unacceptable attacks by demonstrators in Kosovo that left at least 30 of its peacekeepers with injuries, including fractures and burns from IEDs, as well as three soldiers being wounded by firearms, according to NATO.
The situation has again fueled fears of a renewal of the 1998-1999 conflict in Kosovo that claimed more than 10,000 lives and left more than a million people homeless. Ali Aruzi is joining us now. So, Ali, talk about what is next here as it relates to Kosovo. Do we expect this week to see the temperatures continue to stay high? Well, if the two sides can't resolve these issues, the tensions are going to keep inflaming, which they have done in the past. As we spoke about in the last hour, Hallie, these have been going on for centuries. It's a very sensitive issue. It's spilt out into many conflicts over the, the years. Uh, and, and, it's a, and it's a very sensitive issue for Europe. And don't forget, two sides are getting involved. The Russians that want to see divisions within Europe, within NATO, are backing Serbia. They're kind of stoking the flames here. The West wants this to calm down. They're telling the Kosovans not to inflame the situation. So everybody is doing their best to calm the situation down. But the two sides have a long history of disputes and violent disputes at that. And the last thing Europe needs right now is another conflict alongside the one in Ukraine and Russia. So it's really essential that this is calmed down in the short term before it gets out of hand. Ali Abruzzi, thank you very much for that. NBC News covers hundreds of other international stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here are some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of North Korea, the country saying today it failed to put its first spy satellite into space. That rocket crashed into the sea, apparently. This is what we told you about 24 hours ago on this show that led to those emergency alerts that rattled South Korea and Japan. North Korea says it's going to try another launch sometime soon after they figure out what went wrong. On Mount Everest, a government official says a Nepalese Sherpa guide saved a Malaysian climber in a very rare high-altitude rescue. Look at this. This is the guide carrying the climber on his back. He apparently found this climber shivering in this spot called the quote-unquote death zone. It took him like six hours to get that climber down. Another guy joined in. They wrapped him up in a sleeping mat and then kind of dragged him and carried him. Eventually, a chopper got this climber back to base camp. And out of Italy, hundreds of artifacts on display in Rome, stolen from Italian territory and then recovered from an antiquities dealer in London. They're generally from the 8th century BCE through the Middle Ages, and they include things like marble busts and wall paintings. The cultural ministry valued them at more than $12 million. Coming up, an about face from Adidas, why the company says some Yeezy shoes are now going back on sale tonight, months after they cut ties with the rapper formerly known as Kanye West. So Yeezy shoes back on sale today, months after Adidas cut ties with Ye, the rapper formerly known as Kanye West because of his racist and anti-Semitic rants. They had some sneakerheads who were like, okay, well, let me see. Can I snag one of these last pairs of the shoes here? There's like millions of dollars worth of these shoes out there after Adidas split with Ye last year. So this question, right, came up. What did they do with the leftover inventory? The CEO of Adidas says after careful consideration, they decided to sell what they have. What are they going to do with the profits? They're going to donate some of it to anti-racism organizations. How much? That is still a question mark. Adidas will reportedly also have to pay royalties to Ye under the terms of his contract. Brian Chung is joining us now. This is this was such an explosive thing when it happened, right? I mean, beyond just the sort of awfulness of the rants that were anti-Semitic, racist from Ye, there was like this business nexus here with Adidas that came under fire for not distancing itself from Ye sooner. Um, now they're releasing the sneakers, the shoes. How was the release? Like, was there a lot of interest in it? What's the deal? Yeah, well, I'm looking right now on the app where you actually purchased it. And it seems like some of these items are actually sold out and they've been kind of releasing them slowly across the day. And it's not all the inventory that they unloaded today. They're going to be doing it uh, kind of in, in increments uh, over time. But for what it's worth, it seems like they're selling out on some of these if you're willing to pay $230 for a pair of shoes or $70 for a pair of slides. But either way, as you mentioned, the proceeds will not be going to Ye. That's because they terminated their business relationship with him in October. But they did say 
that a significant amount of the proceeds will be going to, as you mentioned, some of those organizations that combat discrimination and hate, like the Anti-Defamation League. Although, when they say significant amount, that does also imply that Adidas is going to pocket some of that money as well. That's right. What is the profit share? We don't really know. We'll have to see if they offer any more details as they continue to do these sales, Allie. It's not like they were trying to sneak this quietly under the radar, right? I mean, Adidas leaned into the release here. They put a countdown clock up online, you know what I mean? Just like they would for any other sneaker release here. Yeah, they did. But what's really interesting is that we didn't know if they would release these sneakers at all. So I've been, you know, right. interestingly watching this story well, for some time. Well, you are a sneaker person. I People am a sneaker know, person. Full disclosure. It, yes. Absolutely. You can't see what I'm wearing right now. But look, at the end of the day, there was a talking point that maybe Adidas was going to have to just simply dump all yeah. these sneakers into a landfill, which, by the way, there's a clothing line as well that they were potentially just going to have to scrap. Ultimately, they decided to sell it to the general public. But again, do this profit sharing. So maybe they can make a few cents on the dollar here. But either way, you cut it a slight. It. There seems to be some demand for all of this, but again, who knows what the sales numbers are and how much Adidas is making off of this. And, and what is an impact on their bottom line? Is it negligible? Is it significant here? Do we know yet? Yeah, well, the company said that it could cost them up to 700 million U.S. dollars, this whole debacle, mm. depending on how the sales of this go. I imagine that they'll be offering more details and updates through the other quarterly reports as they continue to try to sell through this inventory. But there's some estimates out there, Hallie, that they have over a billion dollars in inventory that they'll have to sell through. And I think there's only 20 or 30 styles on the site right now, so it's going to take them some time. Brian Chung, thank you very much. Interesting stuff. Appreciate it. We're learning late tonight Amazon is paying out something like $30 million in settlements for maybe violating the privacy of you and your kids. Start with the Ring doorbell. You know the Ring doorbell. Maybe you have one. You probably know somebody who has one. Turns out Amazon has to pay nearly $6 million as part of a settlement with the FTC which says the company let workers and contractors access people's videos when it wasn't totally necessary for them to do their jobs. You've also got Alexa. I bet you also know Alexa or know somebody who does. Amazon has to pay something like $25 million to settle allegations that Alexa violated kids' privacy rights. The FTC says Amazon kept voice and location info of younger users for years. Amazon, in a statement to NBC News, says, while we disagree with the FTC's claims regarding both Alexa and Ring and deny violating the law, these settlements put these matters behind us. I want to bring in legal analyst Danny Savalo. Start with this Ring settlement, uh, Danny. What does it mean, and is the, is the security issue or this access issue fixed? Yeah, it's an interesting statement by Amazon saying they're ready to put all of this behind them, but there really isn't any indication whether or not the people whose privacy rights were violated, including children and people who may have been captured on ring in intimate moments, what happens to them? And who are they? What is that class of people? And does it include me? Does it include you? Uh, so while this is probably a favorable settlement for Amazon, something they want to put behind them, uh, the question is, going forward, you know, what data is Amazon going to go back and delete? How are they going to unring this bell? And going forward, what are they going to do to tighten up security? Because it it, it, the reports are that Amazon, when Ring Doorbell was capturing video, uh, didn't even have any security protocols back in around 2017, 2018, 2019. And third-party contractors, including reportedly some in Ukraine, were able to access uh, video footage uh, from Ring Doorbells without any kind of security uh, uh, protections. How about the Alexa piece of it? Can you talk through that? The Alexa piece of it, uh, the allegations by the FTC were that uh, Amazon violated a federal law that prohibits saving or uh, uh, archiving permanently children's voices. And so while Amazon apparently denies the claims of the FTC, uh, they are settling it, they are resolving it. Uh, so to some degree, the allegations must have had some basis in fact that, in fact, Alexa was storing voice information or voice uh, files of children and using that data. I mean, once you capture the data, whether it's voice or anything else, what you can do with it from there beyond just look at it uh, is dramatic. You can you can compile it, you can sell it, you can do all kinds of things. So that's why these laws and regulations exist, and that's why FTC uh, went after Amazon. Which of these is more serious, Danny, in your legal view? 
absolutely the ring allegations. I mean, it's one thing to violate federal law, and no one should be saving uh, children's information, including their voice information, in violation of federal law. But the idea that people who use ring, not mm. just on their exterior door, but inside, reportedly uh, uh, contractors or employees, rather, could access cameras that were named things like bedroom. Uh, obviously, Ugh. that's going to have something more interesting to them than simply front door, uh, that label. So if they can see that label and watch the footage unfettered, uh, you can only imagine, uh, or in your worst nightmares, uh, have a nightmare about what people were doing with this data, this visual information. Danny Savalos, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. That does it for us for this hour and for the one before it. And if you missed any of it, catch up on the latest reporting and the newest interviews from our team. You can find us anytime in so many places. You see it there. Peacock, Roku, YouTube, Hulu, etc. Just search Hallie Jackson now. We're going to have more coverage throughout the night here on NBC News Now of the latest developments in Washington. We've also got more coverage with Top Story right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.